I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, but in there somewhere and all that is a, a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Ah, welcome uh, to the Leaves of Glen Cabin, a new bit where I pretend to live in a cabin and not in a mansion. Definitely not just recording in my basement. This is where I read the hottest public domain books and short stories. This week, uh, we're going to finish reading Castle of Terror by Caroline Farr, a gothic horror novel first published in August of 1975. Uh, about the author? There's not much about the author. Most of the titles for horror's production's gothic series were between 1966 and 1977 by Caroline Farr, a pseudonym of Australian writer Dick Richard Wilkes Hunter, though other writers were known to have used the Caroline Farr house name. That's the last time I'm going to be able to say house name. I love the concept, but I can't apply it to my normal life. Let's learn about authors who are dicks from grunge.com, a website that tries to be really cool in how it writes its articles so that the teens take an interest in whatever the hell they've got a topic of. This week, uh, I'm going to try and squeeze in two dicks. One, Jack London. White Fang is one of the most famous 19th century American novels and one of the best stories ever written from a canine point of view. Ugh, if you're a high school teacher trying to force your students to read something and you don't know what a good book is. But there's a lot more going on here that that's me. I said that, not uh, grunge.com. Uh, but there's a lot more going on here uh, than a simple story about a wolf making his way through the world, picking up a copy of White Fang and skip to the part where the heroic beast encounters white people for the very first time after living with a tribe of Native Americans. Quote, As compared with the Indians he had known, the book reads, they were to him another race of superior gods. The novel then goes on to say that White Fang's Native American master was a child god amongst those white-skinned ones. Yeah, it seems like White Fang is really a really racist wolf. Probably because uh, London is one of the biggest bigots in American literature, which is a cute way of saying that. If you think the superior god stuff is bad, then check out London's essay called The Salt of the Earth, which argued that whites are a race of mastery and achievement. <laughs> yeah. London even wrote that genocide uh, was just part of natural selection. Something that was perfectly acceptable when lesser breeds, in quotes, encounter Anglo-Saxon. London kept up with the genocide stuff in a short story called The Unparalleled Invasion, where the Chinese start taking over the world, a horrifying proposition in London's mind. So uh, how does the story end? With the U.S. and Europe attacking China with biological weapons, wiping out all the Chinese and claiming the country for white people everywhere. Yeah, not exactly what you call an uplifting story. Next up... Rolled Doll, Raul Doll. I don't care, he's a jerk, I don't have to say his name correctly. It probably won't come as a surprise that Roald Doll, author of James and the Giant Peach, Matilda, and the BFG, was a bit of a monster in real life. Not unlike the ghoulish characters that populated stories, Doll was reportedly a horrible person who made life miserable for everyone who worked at his publishing company, Alfred A. Knopf. According to one account, whenever Doll dropped by the office, secretaries were treated like servants and tantrums were thrown in both person and in letters. When the company finally told Dahl to get a grip and get out, uh, everyone in the office supposedly got on their desks and cheered. Dahl was so bad that his first wife nicknamed him the Rolled the Rotten. Rolled, Rotten, whatever. In addition to being generally ill-tempered, he was racist and anti-Semitic, of course. And in the original versions of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the Oompa Loopas, which I'm going to say is problematic in themselves, if you ever see the movie, uh, weren't eerie-looking orange dwarves from a mystical island. Instead, they were actually uh, black pygmies. To his credit, it is said that Charlie Bucket was originally supposed to be black until an editor changed Dahl's mind. That's weird. He's racist in one part and, and not racist in another. As pointed out by the BBC, in James and the Giant Peach, the character of the grasshopper proclaims, I'd rather be fried alive than eaten by a Mexican. But worst of all, Dahl went on the record in 1983 as saying, There is a trait in the Jewish character that does provoke animosity. Even a stinker like Hitler didn't pick on them for no reason. My God. That's right, according to Roald Dahl, the Jewish people deserved what they got during the Holocaust, which is definitely not a story you want your kids to hear. That's a pretty uh, crappy way to 
uh, finish off the last chapter of this book. Uh, and I feel like shit now, reading those two. I actually have more. I was hoping for more chapters in this book, but apparently we don't get them. Ah, uh, well, that's the, uh, fox doing its mating call to let me know when to shut up uh, and when we can start reading the last of this book. Well, uh, now that we got that out of the way, why don't we finish the last chapter of this book? A huge, huge chapter that I expect is going to make up for all the slow-moving gaps that were going on through this entire thing. Hey, remember when, uh, when there was an advertisement for Kent cigarettes in the middle of this? I see it again right now here in front of me. They just put cigarette ads in the middle of books back then. Uh, so we're going to start chapter 10. Uh, I hope this isn't going to be a long episode. Uh, well, chapter 10. There was no time, only darkness. I would suffocate before morning, when Shane would find my note. Even then, they might not look here. And then I must have lost all reason, as the air became less and less. Oh, I passed out. How many hours, or days, or weeks later, I had no way of knowing. In my hysterical condition, but I began to hear sound where there had been nothing. See glinting light where there had only been despair and utter dark. And then, in my demented mind, I knew a new fear. They were coming back for me, planning some new torture. Perhaps uh, my death on the rack, uh, or under uh, the terrible guillotine. I crouched in the darkest corner of my cell. I thought it was all dark all over. Trembling, my eyes like a mad person's watching that glinting light, hearing the sounds of someone trying to prize up a rock from the roof. I hid my face, and then in my hair. I began to hear their voices faintly, then louder as the stone began to rise slowly, spilling in more light. There's uh, nobody in there, sir, a voice said grimly. Nobody uh, alive. She has to be there. And alive. She has to be. That voice was familiar. The voice of someone I knew and, and thought I loved. But that was just a trick. Like the way they trapped me in the dungeon and walled me in to die. Immured in peace. Uh, how they trick you. They didn't trick you into it. You, you walked down there on your own, and they caught you, and they shoved you in the thing. Uh, even with my face hidden, the light was beginning to hurt my eyes. You see, she's not in there, sir. Nothing. I'm afraid she's in the sea. Wait! Uh, uh, wait what's in that corner? G uh, give me that light. I hid from the bright light, but it uh, persisted. And the voice was crying suddenly. It's her! <laughs> it's her! It's Megan! I was being lifted and hugged and passed up to someone who held me balanced on the roof of that awful lightness place until Shane could take me back from him again and hold me as though he never meant to let me go. Only I knew nothing of that. I'd gone away. Four dots. I wakened to the white sheets and a, and a smiling woman bending over me in the bedroom of a cottage in the village, uh, not the castle. The woman was Dr. Galliano's wife and the assistant who had helped him bring me back to hell from the brink of insanity, what, from like a few hours of sitting in there? It was Shea Burp Lester. I learned slowly that Oliver Grant and Jean Bethel uh, had not been the weaklings I thought of them. Well, we're halfway through the chapter. We should probably take a break. Uh, it's a better time than any to uh, talk about something very important to me, and that would be Door Glass Incorporated. D-O-R-G-L-A-S-S dot com. Oh, Stephen Dorglas. He's a man of compassion. He's a man that once tried to become a male model. Uh, but with his beautiful upper body and his thin little wispy legs, uh, his legs ruined it. He could only, couldn't get any work that was only work for the upper body. Nobody wants that. No one wants an upper body only model. They want you to wear pants now. All sorts of tight pants. Especially back in the 70s when he was trying to do that. It was all Levi's pants real tight. They like, show, us, show us your butt, Dorglas. Show us your butt. And he was like, I don't really have a butt. And they go, ah, come on, everyone's got a butt, Dorglas. And he turned around, he got no butt. Just a back that just slid to where his legs sprouted out at the bottom. A little butthole probably floating around back there, just trying to changing position depending on which way he was moving. Uh, so after that, uh, with a with a heavy heart, he got into uh, 
private detective, but uh, that didn't work out so well. So then he just decided to just focus on the glass industry. The glass industry can't hurt you like uh, anyone that owns a mansion with its own torture chamber who you trusted. Oh, he showed you his torture chamber and you thought, ah, this is boring, but he's got a lot of money. I trust him. And so uh, Stephen Douglas, he's not going to fall for that kind of shit again. So now he's gotten into the glass business. Oh, they're dedicated to fabricating professionally and starting the highest quality glass products in the nation's top manufacturers. The inventory combined with their years of experience makes them the premier source for installation and repair. Oh, they approach every project with the same goals. Professionalism, integrity, and most importantly, they're discreet. Especially if you reach out to him to say, I want to build some sort of weird glass container that I keep people in against their will so I can just watch them. Oh, he'll do it, but he's been hurt by people like you before. He's not, uh, he's not going to trust you. Like, oh, he's just a guy that wants to build a glass container to hold people in while I can watch them. But I'm not going to trust him. I'm not going to ask him to hang out because he's going to ditch me on Friday night. I'm going to be by myself watching Netflix again. Uh, what do they do? Commercial storefronts, automatic entrances, windows, patio doors, mirrors, shower doors, installation repair. And they will design and build any glass enclosure to keep people in uh, that you want. Clients. Pottery Barn, Williams Sonoma, Sherman Williams, Portillo's, which is a sandwich place that nobody cares about, uh, the Salt Cave, which is a place in Minneapolis where you can go and do yoga and, uh, and, and, and sweat and meditate and do hot yoga and I don't know what else. That's kind of all you can do. Anything that involves not wearing much clothes and just kind of sitting in one spot stretching. They do that in uh, an entire enclosure that they've made uh, out of Himalayan salt that's lit from behind so that it glows like you're in some sort of weird alien membrane. It's disgusting. And they heat it up. The, the hot yoga is like the worst idea for this thing because all your sweat just sticks to the Himalayan salt walls. It's disgusting. But no matter what you think about it, you're probably there because you want to touch it or lick it. But you can't because they even say on their website, do not touch the walls. If you touch the goddamn walls, they're going to call the Minneapolis police which are not the kindest people in the world, as I'm sure everyone's aware of. And uh, and then that's it. That's the last you're going to hear of you. So uh, the only one is uh, Applebee's. Well, with that, why don't we go out to my romance porch of this cabin? Uh, a porch that seems always to be raining. Is it raining from outside, even though it sounds fine right now? Or is it just that the hot steam of all these romance novels that are coming out from Penguin Random House books is just causing all this moisture to build up on the interior roof? It just drips down on you the entire time you stand there and I read to you the latest upcoming romance novel from Penguin Random House books. They just sit there and you're just getting wet. Yeah, all right, well, why don't you just go out there? I don't get it. Where's the rain? It, uh, oh, there it is. Oh, and there you are. Uh, wearing some sort of fuzzy... Is that a wolf suit? You dress like a wolf? What are you, furry? I've read about you people. What do you got there? You got like a little furry breasts. It's a festive little furry buttocks. All right. Why are you wearing that turd fat? Hey, you're pointing at a book. You just dropped the book on the wet floor. The wet deck of my wet porch. A book called Bitten by Kelly Armstrong, part of the Other World series. Category paranormal fiction, suspense and thriller, paranormal romance, contemporary fantasy. About Bitten, burp. The first novel in the number one New York best time so Oh, God, another one of these. What does it cost? 40 bucks? I'm going to do this. I'm just going to write something on a piece of paper. It's just going to have the word poop on it. And then I'm going to submit it and then give $40. And then I bet you the New York Times uh, will mark me as one of their best-selling authors. Frisky dot 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 tells a rather sweet love story and suggests that being a wolf may be more comfortable for a strong, smart woman than being human, says the New York Times book review. The New York Times book review, was that, another 20 bucks? 60 bucks, that's all it takes to get this much credibility. Elena Michaels is the world's only female werewolf, and she's tired of it. Tired of a life spent hiding and protecting, protecting, a life where most uh, her most important job is hunting down rogue werewolves. Oh, I guess that's protecting. Tired of a world that not only accepts the worst in her, her temper, her violence, 
but requires it. Oh, she's a reluctant hero. Worst of all, she realizes she's growing content with that life, uh, with being that person. So she left the pack. The pa- there's a pack of female werewolves too, and returned to Toronto, where she Toronto, where she's trying to live as a human. Uh, when the pack leader calls, asking for her help, fighting a sudden uprising. Oh, oh, she only agrees because she owes him. Uh, once this is over, she'll be squared with the pack and free to live uh, life as a human, which is what she wants, really. This is great writing, which is what she wants, period, really, period. Okay, well, that sounds like crap. Uh, if you want to read Bitten by Kelly Armstrong, uh, you can get it in paperback, 14 bucks, uh, December 31st. 2002. Why do I have this? <laughs> it's supposed to be new and upcoming, and for some reason in their list, they've given me a book that apparently was already released in 2002. Well, apparently you can still get it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Bookshop.org, Hudson Books, there's Andy Bound, Powell's Target, and Walmart. Well, with that, uh, why don't we go back inside where it's not so wet and uh, finish reading the rest of this lengthy chapter. All right, settle in, because uh, we both know that the point of this book, the point of this whole book, isn't going to be that some woman stumbled into a room and might have witnessed a torture and then spent the rest of the book trying to convince people she wasn't dreaming it and then all of a sudden gets caught and then gets freed instantly within two pages. Uh, that can't be happening, so they're going to have to pack a lot in to make this a great American novel. They had driven to Augusta instead of New York to return with state police and a warrant for Count Petro Renese's arrest for what he had done to Jean. They arrived uh, the morning after I had been immured when Shane found my note. I was missed at once. Oh, that was convenient. And a search began for me. Uh, Someone found the slipper I had lost in the study before the Count could find it, and for once more my robe and slippers were meant to be found folded on my bed, as though I'd sleepwalked again, and this time out through the door and into the sea, as Count Renese had suggested. And I was found that morning. If a guy just goes, well, I don't know where she is, maybe she's walked out into the sea. And everyone goes, hmm, that's a good point. Amiri me was to prove the most serious thing he had done. Really, not the torture of the other guy. But uh, strange facts began to emerge from Count's past in Sicily. Oh, the body of a girl had been found in the castle wall in Sicily, uh, in Stormhaven, together with the body of a man who had been guillotined and was her lover. So we learned that he was a man of dangerous passions where a woman like Yasmin uh, were concerned. Uh, It was learned, too, that uh, for generations there had been a uh, taint of insanity in the Renese family. But I don't ever want to think about those things again. Uh, Four dots. I feel sorry for the poor Niccolo Saltia, who received a prison sentence for his part in what happened. But Count Pietro Renese's punishment was greater, it seemed to me, for he was subsequently pronounced insane and uh, sent to a mental hospital from which he might uh, never be released. I never went back to work at Greenfields. Uh, while being driven in Oliver Grant's car to New York, I decided to say yes to my chauffeur, Shay Lester, and become the wife of a doctor, uh, which I expect... I thought for a second there she was saying yes to her chauffeur while Shane was sitting by, like, hey, wait, but I want to marry you. Uh, he just, like, at this random chauffeur just asked her at the right time, uh, which I expect will happen very soon, the moment Shane starts his own practice. And that decision I know is something... I will never regret four dots. Well, that was horse shit. I actually paid for that. I paid for it and had it shipped to me from Amazon.com. Probably one of the biggest mistakes I've made uh, in recent history. Well, with that, uh, why don't we retire to the outhouse so I can take a dump with the beehive hovering over my head on the inside of the outhouse and uh, we can talk about this turd fest of a book. Well, now that I'm all settled in with my bare cheeks uh, smushed into this hole in a plank of wood and a big giant beehive over my head, got the door closed and we're both here alone in my outhouse where I can review uh, what we read. 
the story of a woman who met a hot boy at horse camp and uh, wound up running into him again uh, roughly three years later uh, and then uh, sort of maybe fell in love with him and then after that they wound up going to uh, uh, Count Radizzi's castle for nearly no reason Uh, he's mildly interested in purchasing some horses for the company she works for that sells race horses I don't know I don't care anymore Uh, then they she the guy shows off oh I've got a a room with a guillotine and a bunch of torture devices, and then everyone was kind of bored of it. They weren't really that into it. I would have been like, that's creepy. You're a creepy person. But uh, but no, everyone just kind of seemed annoyed, and they're like, ah, it's cold down here. And then after that, uh, she more there's this annoying thing with her outside, and there's a an old guillotine that collapsed and nearly killed a man, and, and then she fell down when she wasn't supposed to. None of this matters. And then uh, she goes back inside the house at some point. For some reason, she wants to go talk to someone about some idea she had about the collapse of guillotine. And then it discovers a, that this painting of Yasmin that was painted against Yasmin's will is just up on the wall and it's open like a door. So she goes in. She sees the person getting tortured with a mask over their face. So you can't see their face, but they're screaming underneath it. I guess you can see their mouth moving around and underneath the mouth hole. I don't know. It's dumb. And then, uh, do they explain why that mask is there? No. Do they explain specifically why this Yasmin thing? Not really. Do they explain the guillotine? What's the, what's the point of that? Why did we read so many chapters about the guillotine that collapsed? Doesn't matter. So then she tells her that she runs out of there because someone chases her. And then she uh, goes and stumbles down some stairs or whatever. And, and then it's all made to look like she was dreaming. So then the next couple chapters after that is like, I wasn't dreaming. And everyone's like, ah, you're dreaming. And that's for a long time for no reason. Also, for the person that chased her out of the secret room, well, now she knows about the secret room. Kill her! Push her into the ocean! But they don't. They let her wander around. So then she eventually sneaks back in uh, and then goes into the room again. And of course, like an idiot, goes into the room even though they know she knows about the room. So then she goes into the room and then of course someone's there behind her to block her from getting out. And then smokes a cigarette and then pushes her down a hole. And then she's there for, I don't know, three hours or something, but then is acting like she's gone insane and malnourished. I don't know. And then uh, and then they pull her out. And then it's just like, up. Oh, turns out Renizzi's in prison for the rest of his life or whatever. And uh, it turns out his family's been insane forever. And uh, it turns out he's killed other people in Sicily. That's it. It's the dumbest story I think I've ever read. I can see why this guy had a house name. Because he had to hide, unless he was... Was he writing anything better on the side? I've tried looking him up on the internet. There's no trace of this man anywhere on the internet. Uh, what's good about this? Eh, nothing. I was even at least looking for sort of the creepy castle, uh, gothic thing where the woman runs outside dramatically in her nightdress. Uh, like some sort of, like, weird 70s show or something. I don't know, like an episode of Columbo or something. But no, didn't get anything like that. Uh, so that's not good. I can't think of anything good. What's good? I don't know. I got to say the name Renizzi a lot. That seemed to piss people off on Twitter. Uh, what sucks about the book? I just explained everything about the book and everything about it's really bad, so that's what sucked about it. Uh, I don't really know how else to get into it. The story structure is completely horse crap. Character development? There is no character development. Megan? I barely remembered her name until the end of the book. And like, oh yeah, her name's Megan because you care nothing about her. Uh, you can tell that she's written by a sexist man because she's constantly fumbling around, ruining everything. And she's like, well, I'm just a woman. So it's just like, there's nothing to like about this uh, book or these people. What do we learn? People in the seventies that wrote, uh, dime store novels were, uh, just jerks. Uh, so with that, uh, it's probably one of the shorter episodes ever done, 23 minutes. Why don't we read a, a couple more people that were dicks? Like Norman Mailer. Norman Mailer excelled at fiction, the naked and the dead, and nonfiction, the executioner's song, alike. But he failed at being a decent human being. <laughs> For all his talent with a typewriter, Mailer was a genuinely horrible person. Uh, if you need proof, then just ask his daughter Elizabeth, who told the New York Times that her mother, artist Adele Mailer, referred to him after his death as a monster. Why would she say something so terrible about her father of her children? Maybe because Mailer almost stabbed her to death. As it turns out, Mailer was super sensitive when it came to his writing, super sensitive. <laughs>
<laughs> Why'd he almost stab you? Well, he's super sensitive about his writing. <laughs> and when Adele claimed that he wasn't a good writer as Dostoevsky, uh, he grabbed a penknife and went on the attack stabbing her in the stomach in the back. The wound went so deep that he punctured her uh, percardial sac. Ooh, I don't know what that is, but it sounds inappropriate. Burp. But this wasn't the only crime involving an ultra-aggressive author. In 1981, Mailer helped a convict killer named Jack Henry Abbott get out of prison. Mailer was incredibly impressed with Abbott's writing abilities, but he didn't seem to care why Abbott was behind bars. Unfortunately, just a few weeks after getting his freedom, Abbott murdered a waiter during a petty argument. Obviously, Mailer wasn't directly responsible for his death, but when he advocated for Abbott's release, burp, he wasn't uh, thinking about the damage he might unleash. And... Who was going to challenge Mailer and tell him that this was a bad idea? Nobody. Because you were on, uh, you're on his bad side and he might shank you in the gut. That was cute. Uh, I don't know. Anything else to read? Charles Dickens. I'm already sick of him. Ernest Hemingway. Gertrude Stein. Nah, let's just move on. We're going to wrap this episode up. And I'm going to finish taking my shit here in my be-ridden outhouse. And uh, I will see you next week with a new story. You hear that? Out there? The crickets chirping? Those are mating calls. Each cricket desperately, desperately calling out to other female or male crickets dying for attention. Each of them desperate for one of them to come to them with open insect arms and make sex with them. It's a field of whores. And so with that uh, backdrop, I want to tell you that if you want to learn anything more about this podcast, go to nuzzlehouse.com, and that's it. I'm not listing off the rest of my social media. i got a Twitter, uh, which you can go to if you want, but go to nuzzlehouse.com and find out about it. You want to find out if I've got a, a Instagram? Sure, I don't use it, but you can go to nuzzlehouse.com and find out about that, because uh, you're all whores, just like this field of gentle crickets out there chirping in the night. Ah, listen to them.